Well, I think the first point about that is that science is part of culture in general. It is part of uh, what we might call the humanist tradition, which is the uh, tradition of uh, Europe in particular. And uh, for some strange reason, science uh, has drifted slightly uh, from uh, that humanist uh, tradition. I think because um, of a very strong specialization of science in uh, um, in view of its complexity, science has very quickly become highly specialized. And what, uh, returning to um, the cultural origin of science can do for us, is remind us of the generality of science. And um, poetry helps to do that, because uh, the poets, in some sense, are very close to the first question which scientists ask themselves, which is about understanding the world. That is what poets also try to do, but they do so from a different perspective. Um, yes, that's an interesting question. In fact, there is a strong uh, Danish uh, connection here. Um, we have in previous Science Meets Poetry uh, conferences, we have talked quite a lot about Niels Bohr and quantum mechanics. And so, um, as you can imagine, the Copenhagen connection is not new for us, uh, as it is not new, of course, for physicists. And um, we were looking on this occasion to make uh, some different connections with Copenhagen, um, especially we are interested in the connection via astronomy. Because um, in Denmark, of course, uh, one of the greatest astronomers of all time has worked, Tycho Brahe. And Tycho, interestingly enough, was also a poet, uh, which is perhaps less known. It's not uh, one of the uh, uh, facts about him which people usually remember. However, he was a poet and he was very interested in um, connecting science and poetry. And so that is an aspect which um, I think it is very appropriate to bring up in Copenhagen. Furthermore, um, for reasons which I will explain on the day, there is a strong connection between Tycho Brahe and another poet uh, William Shakespeare, who is actually a contemporary and who wrote a play which, of course, everybody knows, and that is Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. So there again, another connection with Denmark. And, uh, of course, um, had the play Hamlet was of interest to a number of people. I would mention, for example, Søren Kierkegaard, who recognized himself, the, the, the um, uh, Danish philosopher recognized himself in the character of Hamlet, which itself is quite interesting. And Hamlet, of course, had a strong influence on uh, many uh, poets, especially of the Romantic period in France and, and the symbolists as well. And so um, somehow there is a Danish connection running through much of um, European poetry, just as it runs through much of European physics. And that, it seems to me, is a very good opportunity um, to remind the public uh, of such a connection. Uh, so, you see, it's a very rich subject. In fact, we have rather had to leave things out, uh, which fortunately we had treated in some earlier Science Meets Poetry um, conferences. Uh, it is, in fact, an extremely rich subject, um, this connection with Denmark, and we didn't have any difficulty at all in uh, finding um, appropriate uh, uh, texts and uh, people uh, to come along and uh, tell us about them. In fact, I haven't told you all about it, but uh, <laughs> just given you one or two uh, examples. 
noticed is that uh, employers who recruit uh, PhDs are complaining that they actually don't know enough about um, expressing their thoughts uh, in, a, in a way which is attractive and um, intelligible perhaps to uh, um, uh, to the common to the common man or to the, the man in the street and uh, indeed um, uh, some of these employers have even been saying that universities should be able to teach them something about that so it sounds as though um, the PhD training method is not entirely successful in that area. Um, I think there are also problems, however, at school level, and uh, these problems are perhaps even more serious than the problems uh, affecting um, PhD graduates. So I, I, I don't want to express myself too much about education because it's a subject I don't know enough about. I've only I've only uh, in my life been a university teacher, and I think the problems which exist start rather earlier. The first ambition we have is, um, if you like, an attempt to restore the humanist connection between science and poetry, which has always existed in the past, and which has simply been forgotten. The second ambition we have is really um, to make to make scientists and and the public alike aware um, of poetry today and the poets aware of science because somehow um, it is possible for these two areas of knowledge to drift apart and to do so in a way that they they remain, they, they function, if you like, uh, as in, a, in a closed world without knowing about each other. Obviously, that is not a very satisfactory situation. And so um, we think it's good for both uh, to bring them together. We obviously want the public to understand that uh, scientists are actually open to poetry. We have in fact got a number of well-known poets who are scientists and so that we, we bring a few of them to the meeting uh, this i think uh, helps to bridge the gap and um, the second uh, well, the second aspect of that of course is that um, there are poets who are interested in science and these poets in many cases have felt isolated in the past. We have brought them to um, this big scientific um, forum and for them it was often a revelation. We had poets who thought they were alone and who traveled to our meetings and discovered other poets um, who, whom actually they met thanks to Aesop. So in some sense we are doing something for science, but we are also doing something for poetry. I would say it's not really starting a movement, because you know a movement always has some sort of pope who leads it, whereas this is much more of a spontaneous uh, effect. We have uh, scientists coming together and discovering about poetry, but we also have poets coming together and creating a kind of school of poetry in which um, they are uh, using science as a, a connection between themselves. This may seem surprising, but you have to know that um, poetry has been through some difficult times. Um, we have had periods in which um, poetry was written, which was so obscure that it would seem even the people who wrote it didn't understand very well what they were doing. Um, here we have uh, a new kind of poetry because if we cannot explain it to, to scientists who are clever people, then I think um, uh, it would be very hard to explain it to anybody else. And so the poets are learning to express themselves in a way that uh, the scientists can understand and vice versa. And this exercise is a very useful one because 
poets are, in, you might say, very interested in the fundamentals. One of the things the poets hate, for example, is vulgarization. And so um, it, it, it acts, if you like, as a, as, a counter, as a counterpoint to all the attempts which are being made to explain science in an oversimplified way. Um, it also acts as a counterpoint as a, to the idea that science should always be practical and science should always be useful. Um, one of the subjects which interests the public enormously and which interests poets enormously is, of course, astronomy. And astronomy is, in fact, not terribly useful uh, in most cases. Um, it, it has, of course, some useful applications like communication satellites, for example, but uh, generally speaking, astronomy is more about finding out uh, where we come from and ans asking, if you like, ans trying to answer some almost metaphysical questions. And that is something I think the public likes, and it's also something that poets like. Um, it may not necessarily be what the funding agencies like, and therefore I think the poets are uh, having a useful influence uh, on uh, um, what is happening in science.